Welcome back. It's Smoking and Toasting, and we are so proud to be brought to you by uh, B&B Butchers and Restaurant, 1814 Washington Ave in Houston, and in the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth. By the way, I was a BB Lemon. I mentioned I was a BB Lemon. I had the fish and chips. That may be the best fish and chips Is I've had good? in Houston. Wow, it was really, really good. Nice. Really, really good. I want to uh, I want to go back to our previous beer that we had. I bet this IPA goes great with cigars. I bet it does. But it goes good with fish and chips, too. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it does. Now I'm dreaming about those fish and chips from BB Lemon. All right, we, didn't, um, we didn't read the can on that thing. Yeah, uh, I have it back over here. It says, this locale IPA is brewed with mighty aromatic hop varieties that deliver tropical notes with a slightly sweet balance. A- uh, Adam was talking about that during the break, yeah. that it has sweetness to it. Provided by the monk fruit extract. That's so, so there's good. monk fruit in there. Sorry, still raving about the dogfish. It's mm-hmm. so good. Yeah. That that Nin- and the adroit theory. We are yep. batting a thousand today. Ninety five calories uh, for the can, by the way, and four percent alcohol by volume. That's pretty cool. Amazing that something that's ninety five calories and four percent is that good. That's so good. Yeah, it really is. Well, welcome back to Smoking and Toasting. We are uh, the program that's all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand rolled cigars. And we are now about to bring you and and listen. I realize that it's a clickbait world. I mean, that's just that's the world we live in. That's the reason so many of our stories, even if they don't deserve to have them added to have it added to them, we add the words right now, right now to the end of the uh, to the end of the headline uh, because it's it's a clickbait world. And so liquor.com, which is a great website, uh, had an article, and we were, you know, uh, going to share this with you on the show. It's the hard truths about the rules of drinking bourbon. And the thing about it is, it's not really rules, but it's it worked well for their headline, and I thought it'd work well for the name of the show. So that's so we went with it. <laughs> so we're just as guilty of the whole clickbait thing as anybody else. So but, the headline of the show is the yeah, rules for drinking yeah. bourbon. Well, right um, now, America's homegrown whiskey uh, bourbon has become one of the most popular pours anywhere, and with so many bottles flooding the market. Uh, it's become a very crowded landscape. It's hard to know what to pick sometimes. So the uh, folks at Liquor.com found a spirit guide. I like that word, a spirit guide. A spirit guide. Uh, Bo Williams, who's the owner of Kansas City's uh, Julep, which is— I do is, not think that word means what you think it means. Uh, probably not. Uh, uh, so this uh, bar that uh, Bo Williams owns is lauded for having one of the most uh, outstanding bourbon selections in the country. And this is uh, his rules, uh, Bo Williams— for picking, sipping, and mixing America's favorite spirits. So we'll share these with you. Here are the rules. Number one, read the label. The important thing to this step is to learn how to decode bourbon labels. He said bourbon's a very broad category. It's important to know what the wording means. For example, he says, always look for the phrase straight bourbon. Oh, wait a second. You don't have to read the label. Jack Daniels is the best bourbon out there. <laughs> well, it has a seven on it. Or maybe it's a sour mash whiskey but anyway go ahead (laughs) straight he says what you want to look for first and foremost when you're searching the shelves it means they're not adding anything to or adulterating the product in any way you're getting the real deal Mm -hmm. so straight bourbon or straight bourbon whiskey is what you are looking for he says also you can look for the age statement on the label although you won't always find it and, and some of the newer producers aren't you know, doing age statements. Yeah, the no age statement is actually the newest. It's kind of a big thing. movement. Yep. Number two, he says, the second rule, seek out value. He says, if you're spending more than forty dollars on a bourbon, you're probably doing it wrong. Isn't that interesting? Funny how that is. Yeah. Uh, on a bottle of bourbon, if you pay in more than forty dollars, he says, you may be doing it wrong. Of course, if you're a collector looking for, you know, extra age Pappy Van Winkle or something, expect in, to in pay. In other words, yeah. anything Chris Hart or <laughs> Alan Denny has. That's right, exactly. You expect <laughs> to pay a premium. How much was that uh was that whiskey we had when we were at Alan's uh, place? The Master's he, Keep that we yes, had. Yes, yes. Um a hundred and eighty ish. I know, yeah. I'm just glad that you know he makes a lot of money. Pretty amazing, you know, because he's able to buy those things and share them with us. It's, <laughs> it's a amazing. wonderful thing. Uh, but if you're just starting out, he says <clears throat> affordable bourbons are everywhere. He recommends Wild Turkey 101. He says mm-hmm. it's wonderful juice at a reasonable price point, and bottlings from Four Roses and Heaven Hill, and uh, 
Uh, even Evan Williams and JTS Brown, he said, are, are, are places you can go for a good bourbon at a reasonable price, and it, it's not something where you're sacrificing quality because you're paying under Knob dollars Creek. Yep, absolutely. I mean, there's a ton. Like, absolutely. In the 20 to $30 range, it's amazing how many good bourbons are out there that mm-hmm. are not expensive, That's right. That's like, right. that are just fine. And Wild Turkey, it's funny that they uh, mention that on there, because a lot of people think Wild Turkey, ah. Uh, they think that's well, Grandpa's we're not, whiskey. We're yeah. not in college anymore. Don't shoot it. Right, right. Well, there you go. That's exactly <laughs> try, right. Try stopping that's and tasting it, you know? In fact, rule number three is skip the shot glass. Don't shoot your, yeah. your bourbon. Sip it. Uh, he says, you know, the, the flavors of bourbon can be uh, different from scotch, but he recommends sipping a neat pour from a Glencairn glass. Because don't shoot your whiskey, number one. Don't be the guys that chug it out of the bottle. Uh, what, what, pour it into what's a wrong Glen with Car- that? <laughs> pour it into a Glencairn Bartender, glass. Bartender, leave the bottle. And sip it, yeah. I what happened love, to those days? I always love how that happens like in the movies. Like right, the, just leave the, the bartender bottle. leaves the bottle. That never happens in real life. <laughs> Unless you're like at a table with P. Diddy getting bottle service. I'm sure somewhere. that's out of, that, that, yeah. there's a lot of laws against that. I'm Although, sure there, there are. are a lot of places that are like wine and beer only where you can BYOB and then you just have your own bottle. Right. It's yeah. not the same though. It's not. It's like, not the same. You could maybe ask the bartender and tip them a little extra if you can just like hand it to him, have him bring it over and say, leave the bottle. <laughs> right. That way your friends think that you're super cool. Like, That's Ooh, <laughs> yeah, I like it. Um, the, the owner of this uh, bar of Julep says that aroma is a huge part of your bourbon experience. So you need a glass, a Glencairn, that lets you capture the aroma, the caramel, the nutty uh, aroma, whatever, uh, to get you excited and kind of cue up the rest of your senses to the uh, bourbon that you're going to taste. A shot glass does not enhance the experience. No. It just doesn't. But Even also if remember, if, yeah. if someone does say, hey, we're buying you shots, and you end up with a shot of whiskey, mm-hmm. you don't have to shoot the whiskey. You yep. can actually sip the whiskey, even if it's in a shot glass. He says you can also use old-fashioned rocks glasses with a, you know. And you can a, use Cruz's special, I'm just going to put the whiskey in my nose technique well, yeah, to I, really I like get to those it, flavors. To, to actually snort the whiskey, which is, uh, <laughs> you know, doesn't seem like it would work, but it happens a lot. Uh, rule number four, dilution can be a solution. Yes. Uh, water is your friend, he says, and do not be afraid of it. People think there's only one way to drink bourbon, and he says that's wrong-headed. Water is not a deal breaker. Uh, the current trend for uncut, unfiltered barrel strength whiskeys means that most bourbons actually yeah. benefit from a little bit of water. So a couple things I want to say about that. I've been at bars and ordered whiskeys or scotches, um, spirits in general. Mm-hmm. And I almost always ask for a glass of ice and water because if I want a little ice, I can pull a nice chip out and put it in there. If I want a little water dilution, I can and, use and that. You get and there's some inevitably that. Yes. some guy next yeah. to me going, I can't believe you ruined that whiskey with some water. You know, those are people who are not drinking that kind of whiskey. That's right. You know, and they're not drinking it that way. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. But. Don't impose that on me. I drink my whiskey how I want. And there is not a single distiller that I've ever met or know of that wouldn't say, oh, try it with a little water. Mm -hmm. I literally, if you go on, you can go on every um, Scotch distiller's website Mm -hmm. and watch the videos. And they'll tell you all about their water and everything. And they will always tell you. And then you add a little bit of water. Mm-hmm. In that beautiful Scotch accent, right. they will always tell you that, and there is not a distiller out there who won't say add a little bit of water. And then you got the guy at the bar who's obviously the smart guy and tells mm-hmm. you how to drink your whiskey. Don't listen to him; that's yeah. silly. All right. Uh, guess what number five is? Don't listen to the guy that tells you how to drink your whiskey. Close, close. It's upgrade your ice. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, ice they, is important. You know, bourbon has big and bold flavors, so a little bit of ice and water won't kill the thing. It'll probably enhance it, uh, but they do say. Be wary of small, watery pieces of ice that can dilute your uh, bourbon too quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, or dilute it more than you intended uh, to dilute it. He says, I prefer to take my time, and I want a similar experience from when I start to when I uh, finish. So solid ice, uh, never a bad idea. Now, I know what you like to do is to put the ice cube in. Ta- you, you taste I it room like, temperature, then you taste I it I like cold. the ride. So I yeah. uh, like if I get... My druthers, and I have time to sit down and have a whiskey like this. Uh, I'm going to try it neat, and then I'm going to add uh, a chip of ice. You know, I say a chip. It could be a chip of ice. could be a little block of ice or whatever. And I want to taste it cold. Mm-hmm. And then once I taste it cold, I generally will hold it in my hand. You'll see me do this where I just hold it in my hand. I'll swirl it around. But I'll hold that glass in my hand until that 
ice dilutes enough in there and I get those flavors. What I really like, and it's funny that that mentioned it, don't use the small chips of ice. I actually like the small chips of ice because I'll add enough ice to dilute it and then I want to taste it diluted and as it gets warm again because Mm -hmm. cold masks certain flavors. Right. So you get to taste, listen to this ride that you get with a small chip of ice, okay? You get to taste it neat. And you get certain flavors that way. Then you put a chip of ice in there, and it chills the whiskey. You taste which, it at a different temperature. At, yeah. Right, and it's a different temperature, and it tastes different. And then as that ice melts in, and it's not a big cube of ice, it's a small cube of ice, so you're adding a little bit of water at a time, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you get to taste it as the dilution process happens. And then before you're done with this whiskey, it's warm again from your hand, and you get to taste it diluted and warm again so right. it's not masking any flavors that is a big ride for one glass of whiskey That's and i love right. that and when we were at the rainbow lodge uh last week with mark yes. Burrell, and we were talking about uh, the cocktails and mm-hmm. so he was talking about uh that they get special ice yes uh brought in which is it's uh, important of a higher quality and uh works much better in the cocktails and i'm sure if you had some uh just in your uh, bourbon as well well if you pay a premium and let's let's face it you're going to uh rainbow lodge you're not buying the cheap drinks Mm -hmm. because they don't have them right like they just they don't bother with that stuff. So you're buying a premium cocktail. Right. They're going to use a premium ice. There's a re- They could do this way cheaper. They could just use ice out of the well, chip it in there, and mix mm-hmm. it like any bar down the road does. But they use a premium uh, block of ice specifically made for this drink. And it's different for different drinks a lot of times. And the reason they do that is you just paid for the bartender to make this outstanding cocktail and pour it over a piece of ice. Do you really want all that ice to melt in, dilute the whole thing, right. and change the flavor right. on a premium cocktail? Yes. Yeah. Not I, really. I, I mean, You no, want it to be cold, right. but... No, no, I, I see what you're saying. You want it to be cold, but... You don't want it to change the cocktail. Now, that's right. different if you're doing a whiskey where you get to change, uh, you know, try all the different flavors. Right. But that's Taking the ride. That's a different thing, you know? Well, speaking of cocktails, the final uh, rule he has uh, is try an old fashioned. He says an old fashioned can really turn people on to how wonderful a bourbon experience could be without just drinking it on his on you know on its mm-hmm. own ice a little bit of sugar and bitters helps bridge the flavor profiles kind of makes it a little more accessible more palatable for some people especially when they're first starting out uh, but you will begin to understand and experience that bourbon uh, flavor the goal he said is to accent the goal of a, of a good old fashioned is to accent the flavors of the bourbon rather than to mask them and probably no drink does that better than the classical. Now, fashion. let's talk about that because there's a lot of people out there who would say, uh, why would you use that level of bourbon to mix? Mm-hmm. Well, the truth is, the better your ingredients are, generally the better your drink is. Or pizza. Or pizza. I'm, so, I'm sorry, that was. <laughs> I, I, fell, I fell prey to an advertising tagline. I but, apologize. Uh, but yeah, so the better <laughs> better ingredients, better bourbon, um, a better, better drink. Anyway, uh, make it make sense. But the bottom line is, um, if you're going to mix it, yes, better bourbon is going to make a better drink. If you're pouring Coke in it, the problem with certain mixed drinks, like mm-hmm. Coca-Cola is a very strong, very robust flavor. Mm-hmm. Coca-Cola is going to mask a lot. Now, if you want to take a really nice bourbon and pour Coca-Cola in it, that's your business. Right. It's your bourbon, you know? <laughs> um but here's a thought to consider. An old-fashioned doesn't beat up the flavor of the bourbon. Right. It, it enhances, enhances it. the flavor yes. of the bourbon. So, therefore, a higher-end bourbon is going to make a better... A better old-fashioned. Old-fashioned. And higher-end doesn't in- just mean price point. Right. Right. You know? It's not seven and seven. Yeah. There are you a know? lot of bourbons out there that are hard to find that aren't that expensive. Right. You know? You're absolutely right. <laughs> and, and if you think about it, the the concept behind the cocktail, when you're at a place that has a more expensive cocktail, is that every single ingredient usually is a step above. Mm-hmm. They were talking uh, at the uh, Rainbow Lodge last week, I think it was during one of the breaks, but they were talking about how one of those drinks used a syrup that they got from a particular sweet tea that they were able to source this sweet yes. tea. And then they from that sweet tea they took and basically condensed it into a syrup that they use in this one particular yes. drink. I mean, these guys are crafting the ingredients that go into these things. So whether it's yeah. the They're ice They're not going down the, and yeah. buying the big jug of simple syrup from the local supplier exactly. from, exactly. you know, exactly. off the so. truck. Uh, 
So anyway, the last sentence in this uh, in this rules uh, says there's no wrong way to consume bourbon, as uh, uh, Mr. Williams says. Uh, the only mistake is to not enjoy it while you're drinking it. So really, there are no rules because there's no wrong way, as we said. But uh, it made for a good headline and hopefully for a good uh, title for this week's show. And now Speaking of bourbon, and now, yeah, or not, we're going to have some rum. <laughs> so this rum uh, should be interesting. This is a rum we've had. Dos Madeiras. Uh, this is a rums. very dark rum. We've had uh, Dos Madeiras rums on the show before, but this one is aged for five years in the Caribbean, and a further five years in uh, uh, Spain. It's uh, called Five Point Five Triple Aged Rum, aged in very old sherry casks. And it is that uh, would explain the color. One of the sort of top of the line um, uh, uh, Dos Madeiras uh, rums. It's the product of a triple aging process. First, it rests for five years at its place of origin in the Caribbean. Then it's moved to the Williams and Humbert uh, facilities in Spain, where it's subjected to two more phases of aging for a period of five years. On the uh, arrival, they transfer it to American oak casks which previously held sherry, and uh, subsequently to casks which have been used to age uh, Don Guido. Uh, both uh, Dos Cortados and Don Guido are an average age of 20 years, guaranteed and uh, certified. So that's what the casks are all about. So uh, the rum itself is, um, is I mean, this, is, this rum, I think, would be a much more sort of ordinary Dos Medeiros, but it's the aging process that is going to make it different in whatever way it's different. So, so. I, I, I haven't I haven't taken a sip yet, um, but just on the nose, what's well, you, amazing about this is you get the molasses yeah, right I, up front. Like huge I can smell molasses, the molasses right. without even going But uh, then to when my you get it close to your nose, it's all oak and sherry. Well, you're so right, because it is sitting on the tabletop, it's molasses. Yeah. But once you bring it up right to your there, nose. Right there, it's oak and sherry. Yeah, like, very uh, interesting. A ton of it. Very interesting. Well, you know, there's nothing quite like a really good, well-aged rum. And rum is generally not aged nearly as long as a lot of other spirits are aged. It's it's generally pretty good, fairly young. And if you are drinking a five-year rum, that's considered to be a, a moderately well-aged rum. Whereas a five-year whiskey might be sort of like on the minimum age uh, side if you're making an age declaration on the whiskey. Have so. you tried this already? Um, yes. I want to point out, this has no heat to it whatsoever. It's amazing. Like, it doesn't even come back and hug you, really. No. It, there's no heat. This is so... And as a matter of fact, it leaves this molasses, brown sugar molasses mm-hmm. flavor. Mm-hmm. With this super awesome, like the retro hail has this sherry and oak complexity to it. There's almost a little smokiness to it. Yes, smoky. Definitely. Um, mixed in with that, but that maple sugar kind of flavor going on there, that molassesy, mapley, sugary. Mm-hmm. Man, this, I want this over pancakes. You like, all, it's so sweet say, and so delicious. It's not gritty, but it almost tastes like it should be. With with the molasses syrupy uh, sort of sugar uh, vibe. That whole time I'm talking, I'm just now detecting a little bit of heat coming coming back, back in. Just, yep, yep. Just warming up like the back of my palate. That's the, the, absolutely crazy. The hugs from rum can be often more subtle than the whiskey hugs. This is definitely a much more subtle. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Spirit hug. Yeah, that will that will sneak up on you a little bit. This is this um, is really good. It's really delicious. I'm. Uh, kind of blown away by the difference in smell from when it's on the tabletop to when it comes to your nose. So we talked just a minute ago about mixing bourbons, okay? And rums are much the same way. This right here, I don't know uh, of a whole lot of rum drinks uh, that Where just you'd want this- enhance the flavor of the rum. Right. Uh, this has so many subtleties that I think mixing this would be a little more pointless because you'd lose a lot of the subtleties of right. what if this has. Right, if you were has. to add, you know, simple syrup or or right. uh, mint or other things to this, to a cocktail made with this, right. you would probably lose some of the subtlety of that sherry. Yeah, I don't milk. know, like, for instance, if you made a rum and coke with this, and I know that's mm-hmm. like the holy hand grenade of... 
<laughs> we'll just I, blow this I, up. I like rum and coke, but um, I don't know if it goes here. Right, right, and, and it's or rum and Dr Pepper or whatever like this. I think the problem with this is the flavors are so subtle mm-hmm. and so nice, and s- the finish is so nice that something like that would just completely mask the flavor of this. And I don't think you'd get much flavor difference in a rum and coke, for instance, between this rum and a much less. Uh, or much more cost-effective rum, mm-hmm, or just right. cheaper rum in mm-hmm. general. Um, as a matter of fact, sometimes when you have something like a Coca-Cola as a mixer, I think you kind of want something that has a little more bite to it overall, you, you so may that be right. you can yes. kind of taste a little more the alcohol to part it. of it. Yeah, no, that's a good this point. right here though is just on its own, and room temperature is amazing. I'm imagining this with a cube of ice and water down a little bit, and I bet the flavor is just all over the place. They're so good. This uh, rum is, you know, depending on where you buy it, it's around $40 for a bottle. This is outstanding. So it's really, you know, it's one of the beautiful things about rums. It it feels to me like with rum you can often get a more premium rum, like a super high-end rum, at the cost of maybe sort of a medium-level uh, whiskey. whiskey. Yeah. Uh, and whereas the the super premium whiskeys have a tendency to go up into the hundred dollar and above range, the super premium rums are generally forty plus. Yeah, you know, and and it, this I would almost refer to this as a super premium. This rum. is outstanding. This at is least at least based on the way it drinks. It's so sweet. I know it's it's I bet really this delicious. This would go really good with a cigar. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking that with almost any cigar, you could do it with a big one, or you could do it with something that was uh, was more mellow. I think, and mm-hmm. they both would uh, would work with this. And again, that's one of the things I love about rums is that um, you know the the whiskey sniff, the comparing of of the whiskey and the cigar you have seems to be a little more specific. Rums almost seem to work with almost any cigar yeah. that you pair them with. Yeah. You know. Well, the I, the overall flavor profile of rum as a group of drinks, mm-hmm. um, as a, I think as just a spirit, yeah, yeah, as a spirit, just generally goes, uh, goes well with cigar. Mm. You know, like coffee and cigar, coffee and cigar go great together. It almost doesn't matter what the cigar yeah. is. Yeah, uh, agreed, agreed. Well, uh, this is absolutely delicious, and it is something you can find. It's not uh, uh, Chris Hart style rare. Uh, you can find this at your uh, local store if you have a store that stocks, you know, a reasonable uh, quantity of rums, and it's worth seeking out. I I like Dos Madeiras anyway. The other rums of theirs that I've had have mm-hmm. all been very very good, uh, but this may be their sort of creme de la creme, at least based on what we've had. Well, so I, I'm glad you bring awesome rum. Uh, yes, and I'm glad you bring awesome. Uh, chewy beers, awesomeness. <laughs> I just bring awesomeness. I was just I was referring to your <laughs> chunky beers. Uh, speaking of chunky beers, I don't think it'll be chunky, but uh, nine hundred three Brewers uh, they have I think some of the most interesting specialty beers and limited beers uh, of any of the breweries that are in the uh, greater uh, Texas area, and we're going to try their Sasquatch Reserve. But it's not just the Sasquatch Reserve. This is a special variant. It is the Sasquatch Reserve Oak Aged. Imperial chocolate milk stout, which sounds like it would go really that's good after yeah, this. I'm gonna save it? a little bit of this actually. <laughs> that's, that, that could be, drink through that pretty quick. That may be a nice pairing. So uh, we will get to that coming up. You are listening to Smoking and Toasting, and we will be right back. <laughs> 